Washing machine. A washing machine or washer is a machine designed to clean laundry such as clothing, towels and sheets. Hand-operated washing machines appeared in the 1850s. The first modern machine was developed in 1910 by an American, Alva J. Fisher. To understand top-loading washing machines, let's look at these shared characteristics. Tub on a vertical axis, central agitator, motor and a pump, fill valve, timer and selector switches, clutch and brake mechanism, motor coupler and or belt. The tub is where you put the clothes. In most washing machine brands, this tub has hundreds of small holes that allow the water to flow through to an outer tub. The outer tub is solid and holds the water. At the center of the inner tub is an agitator. The agitator pivots clockwise and counterclockwise about three-fourths of a revolution, plunging clothes through water to wash them. Clothes keep moving from the top of the tub down to the bottom and back again. This motion along with friction caused by clothes rubbing together allows detergent and water to reach every nook and corner of your load and loosens soil. The motor drives the agitator during the wash cycle and spins the clothes during the damp, dry or spin cycle. The pump removes the water from the tub and lifts it out to the drain. The fill valve which is about the size of a coffee cup is something also called a water inlet valve. It controls the entry of hot and cold water into the machine. The timer runs the washing machine in a predetermined pattern. It provides the electricity to all of the washing machine components at the correct time and for the correct length of time. These let you adjust certain settings, for example, the water temperatures, spin speed, timer cycle and so on. Air conditioner an air conditioner is an appliance, system or mechanism designed to extract heat from an area via a refrigeration cycle. In 1820, British scientist and inventor Michael Faraday discovered that compressing and liquefying ammonia could chill air when the liquefied ammonia was allowed to evaporate. In 1902, the first modern electrical air conditioning was invented by Willis Havilland Carrier in Syracuse, New York. All room air conditioners function pretty much the same, although energy savings and cooling capacity vary by brand and model. The basic components are a compressor, evaporator coil, refrigerant-filled tubing, and condenser coil. When the unit is running, the circulating fan and compressor are running simultaneously. The fan motor has two fan blades attached to it on either end. The fan blade on the inside part of the unit continually draws room air over the evaporator coils which are cold. The fan blade on the outside part of the unit continually draws fresh outside air over the condenser coils which are warm. Because the evaporator coils are cold, they cause moisture in the room to collect on them, much like a cup of ice water on a warm, humid day. When the amount of moisture increases, it begins to drip down off of the coils into the bottom pan of the air conditioner. The thermostat on a window air conditioner works by sensing the air temperature entering the air conditioner. As the air entering the unit reaches the set temperature, it will cause the compressor to turn off. When the room warms up, the thermostat senses the added heat and the compressor kicks back on to create more of the hot pressurized gas. At some point, the temperature of the room may equal the cooling power of the air conditioner and the compressor will shut off again. ATM an automated teller machine or ATM is a computerized telecommunication device that provides the customers of a financial institution with access to financial transactions in a public space without the need for a human clerk or bank teller. John Adrian Shepard, Baron of De La Rue, developed the first electronic ATM which was installed first in Enfield Town in North London, United Kingdom on 27th June 1967 by Barclays Bank. An ATM is simply a data terminal with two input and four output devices. Card Reader The card reader captures the account information stored on the magnetic stripe on the back of an ATM debit card or credit card. 
the host processor uses this information to route the transaction to the cardholder's bank. Keypad. The keypad lets the cardholder tell the bank what kind of transaction is required and for what amount. Also, the bank requires the cardholder's personal identification number for verification. Output devices. Speaker. The speaker provides the cardholder with auditory feedback when a key is pressed. Display screen. The display screen prompts the cardholder through each step of the transaction process. Leased line machines commonly use a monochrome or color CRT display. Dial-up machines commonly use a monochrome or color LCD. Receipt printer. The receipt printer provides the cardholder with the paper receipt of the transaction. Cash dispenser. The heart of an ATM is the safe and cash dispensing mechanism. The entire bottom portion of most small ATMs is a safe that contains the cash. Like any other data terminal, the ATM has to connect to and communicate through a host processor. The host processor is analogous to an internet service provider in that it is the gateway through which all the various ATM networks become available to the card holder. Most host processors can support either leased line or dial-up machines. Leased line machines connect directly to the host processor through a four-wire point-to-point and dedicated telephone line. Dial-up ATMs connect to the host processor through a normal phone line using a modem and a toll-free number or through an internet service provider using a local access number dialed by modem. The host processor may be owned by a bank or financial institution or it may be owned by an independent service provider. Compact Disc A compact disc or a CD is an optical storage medium with digital data recorded on it. The digital data can be in the form of audio, video or computer information. James Russell invented the compact disc in 1965. It is a thin circular disc of metal and plastic about 12 cm in diameter. It's actually made of three layers. Most of a CD is made from a tough, brittle plastic called polycarbonate. Sandwiched in the middle, there is a thin layer of aluminium. Finally, on top of the aluminium is a protective layer of lacquer. Polycarbonate disc layer has the data encoded by using bumps. A reflective layer reflects the laser back. A lacquer layer is used to prevent oxidation. Artwork is screen printed on the top of the disc. A laser beam reads the polycarbonate disc is reflected back and read by the player. Most of a CD consists of an injection molded piece of clear polycarbonate plastic. During manufacturing, this plastic is impressed with microscopic bumps arranged as a single continuous extremely long spiral track of data. We'll return to the bumps in a moment. Once the clear piece of a polycarbonate is formed, a thin reflective aluminium layer is sputtered onto the disc covering the bumps. Then a thin acrylic layer is sprayed over the aluminium to protect it. The label is then printed onto the acrylic. A cross section of a complete CD looks like this. A CD has a single spiral track of data circling from the inside of the disc to the outside. You will often read about pits on a CD instead of bumps. They appear as pits on the aluminium side, but on the side, the laser reads from, they are bumps. The incredibly small dimensions of the bumps make the spiral track on a CD extremely long. If you could lift the data track off a CD and stretch it out into a straight line, it would be 0.5 microns wide and almost 3.5 miles long. The CD player has the job of finding and reading the data stored as bumps on the CD. Considering how small the bumps are, the CD player is an exceptionally precise piece of equipment. The drive consists of three fundamental components. A drive motor spins the disc. This drive motor is precisely controlled to rotate between 200 and 500 RPM depending on which track is being read. A laser and a lens system focus in on and read the bumps. A tracking mechanism moves the laser assembly so that the laser's beam can follow the spiral track. The tracking system has to be able to move the laser at micron resolutions. The fundamental job of the CD player is to focus the laser on the track of bumps. The laser beam passes through the polycarbonate layer, reflects off the aluminium layer and hits the optoelectronic device that detects changes in light. The bumps reflect light differently than the lens and the optoelectronic sensor detects that change in reflectivity. 
The electronics in the drive interpret the changes in reflectivity in order to read the bits that make up the bytes. Therefore, as the laser moves outward, the spindle motor must slow the speed of the CD. That's why the bumps travel past the laser at a constant speed and the data comes off the disk at a constant rate. Thus, the scanning laser gradually recreates the pattern of zeros and ones on the disk. CDs were originally used just for storing music. During the 90s, CD technology also became popular for storing computer programs, games and other information. The difference between CDs and DVDs is the amount of information they can store. The latest optical disc use a technology called Blu-ray to store six times more data than DVDs or 40 times more than CDs. Elevators An elevator or a lift is a vertical transport vehicle that efficiently moves people or goods between floors of a building. They are generally powered by electric motors that either drive traction cables and counterweight systems or pump hydraulic fluid to raise a cylindrical piston. Alicia Otis, a mechanic in a mattress factory in Yonkers, New York, pioneered the technology of elevator safety and paved the way for the modern passenger elevator. There are two major elevator designs in common use today, hydraulic elevators and roped elevators. In this section, we'll see how roped elevators work. The most popular elevator design is the roped elevator. In roped elevators, the car is raised and lowered by traction steel ropes rather than pushed from below. The ropes are attached to the elevator car and looped around a sheave. A sheave is just a puller with a groove around the circumference. The sheave grips the hoist ropes, so when you rotate the sheave, the ropes move too. The sheave is connected to an electric motor. When the motor turns one way, the sheave raises the elevator. When the motor turns the other way, the sheave lowers the elevator. In gearless elevators, the motor rotates the sheaves directly. In geared elevators, the motor turns a gear train that rotates the sheave. Typically, the sheave, the motor and the control system are all housed in a machined room above the elevator shaft. The ropes that lift the car are also connected to a counterweight, which hangs on the other side of the sheave. The counterweight weighs about the same as the car filled to 40% capacity. In other words, when the car is 40% full, the counterweight and the car are perfectly balanced. The purpose of this balance is to conserve energy. With equal loads on each side of the sheave, it only takes a little bit of force to tip the balance one way or the other. Basically, the motor only has to overcome friction. The weight on the other side does most of the work. To put it another way, the balance maintains a near constant potential energy level in the system as a whole. Using up the potential energy in the elevator car builds up the potential energy in the weight. The same thing happens in reverse when the elevator goes up. The system is just like a seesaw that has an equal heavy kid on each end. Both the elevator car and the counterweight ride on guide rails along the sides of the elevator shaft. The rails keep the car and counterweight from swaying back and forth and they also work with the safety system to stop the car in an emergency. Roped elevators are much more versatile than hydraulic elevators as well as more efficient. Typically, they also have more safety systems. Fire extinguishers A fire extinguisher is an active fire protection device used to extinguish or control small fires, often in emergency situations. Typically, a fire extinguisher consists of a hand-held cylindrical pressure vessel containing an agent which can be discharged to extinguish a fire. The modern fire extinguisher was invented by British Captain George William Manby in 1818. Fire is the result of a chemical combustion reaction, typically a reaction between oxygen in the atmosphere and some sort of fuel. There are three essential elements involved in producing fire heat, oxygen and fuel. To put a fire out, you need to effectively remove one of these elements. Fire extinguishers are designed to remove at least one of these elements so that a fire will die out. A fire extinguisher is quite like a giant acrosol can, often with two different substances inside. One of them is a solid, liquid or gas substance for fighting the fire. The other one is called a propellant and is a pressurized chemical that makes the firefighting substance come out when you press the extinguisher handle. 
When you depress a lever at the top of the cylinder, the material is expelled by high pressure. Inside an extinguisher, a plastic siphon tube leads from the bottom of the fire suppressant reservoir to the top of the extinguisher. A spring-mounted valve blocks the passageway from the siphon to the nozzle. At the top of the cylinder, there is a small cylinder filled with compressed gas, liquid carbon dioxide, for example. A release valve keeps the compressed gas from escaping. To use the extinguisher, you pull out the safety pin and depress the operating lever. The lever pushes on an actuating rod which presses the spring-mounted valve down to open up the passage to the nozzle. The bottom of the actuating rod has a sharp point which pierces the gas cylinder release valve. The compressed gas escapes applying downward pressure on the fire suppressant material. This drives the material up the siphon and out the nozzle with considerable force. The proper way to use the extinguisher is to aim it directly at the fuel rather than the flames themselves and move the stream with a sweeping motion. There are three main types of extinguisher and they work in slightly different ways. Water extinguishers, dry chemical extinguishers and carbon dioxide extinguishers. It's important always to use the right extinguisher for the fire. Using the wrong extinguisher can put your life in danger and make the fire worse. For example, you must never use water extinguishers on electrical fires because you could electrocute yourself and the people nearby. Hearing aids. A hearing aid is a device that can amplify sound waves in order to help a deaf or hard of hearing person hear sounds more clearly. Body-worn aids were the first type of hearing aid invented by Harvey Fletcher while working at Bell Laboratories. Today, body aids have largely been replaced by behind-the-ear instruments. Before explaining hearing aids, let's see how we hear sounds. Sound is simply a kind of energy we can hear. Things make sounds when they vibrate, setting air in motion around them. The pinnae of your ears are shaped so they can gather sounds coming from different directions and funnel them into the ear canal. At the end of your ear canal, there's a tiny drum-like skin called the ear drum. When incoming sound waves hit the ear drum, they make it vibrate. Three tiny bones called the hammer, anvil and stapes in your skull detect those ear drum vibrations and pass them on to a snail-shaped organ called the cochlea which is filled with fluid and tiny hairs called cilia. The sound vibrations make this fluid in the cochlea wash back and forth, agitating the cilia. The cilia detect those vibrations and send electrical signals to your brain, which you hear as sounds of different frequency. In short, then, hearing is all about sound energy entering your ears and being turned into electrical impulses by tiny hairs inside your cochlea. One of the most common type of hearing loss happens when the hairs in the cochlea become damaged. If there are fewer hairs, sounds produce less stimulation in your brain, so things need to be louder for you to hear them. That's where hearing aids come in. They can't help everyone with impaired hearing, but they can often make a difference to hearing problems caused by a loss of cochlear hair cells. Hearing aids come in two main kinds. They are analog hearing aids and digital hearing aids. Now, we will see analog hearing aid works. Sound waves travel toward your ear and the hearing aid you're wearing behind it. A small microphone picks up the sounds and turns them into an electric current. An amplifier circuit increases the strength of the current. A small button battery powers the amplifier circuit and other components. The amplified current drives a small loudspeaker. The loudspeaker plays its sound into a tube called the ear hook. The ear hook plays the sound through the ear mold into your ear canal. Sound waves of greatly increased volume travel to your inner ear. Although a hearing aid can never restore hearing completely, it can make a huge difference to a person's life by helping them converse more normally and enjoy everything from TV and radio to recorded music and birdsong. Laser a laser is a device that emits light through a process called stimulated emission. The term laser is an acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. A laser is effectively a machine that makes billions of atoms pump out trillions of photons all at once so they line up to form a really concentrated light beam. The first laser constructed in 1960 by Theodore Maiman based on the earlier work by Charles H. Towns. 
Laser light is very different from normal light. Laser light has the following properties. The light released is monochromatic. It contains one specific wavelength of light. The wavelength of light is determined by the amount of energy released when the electron drops to a lower orbit. The light released is coherent. It is organized. Each photon moves in step with the others. This means that all of the photons have wave fronts that launch in unison. The light is very directional. A laser light has a very tight beam and is very strong and concentrated. A flashlight, on the other hand, releases light in many directions and the light is very weak and diffuse. To make these three properties occur, it takes something called stimulated emission. This does not occur in your ordinary flashlight. In a flashlight, all of the atoms release their photons randomly. In stimulated emission, photon emission is organized. The photon that any atom releases has a certain wavelength that is dependent on the energy difference between the excited state and the ground state. If this photon should encounter another atom that has an electron in the same excited state, stimulated emission can occur. The other key to a laser is a pair of mirrors, one at each end of the lasing medium. Photons with a very specific wavelength and phase reflect off the mirrors to travel back and forth through the lasing medium. In the process, they stimulate other electrons to make the downward energy jump and can cause the emission of more photons of the same wavelength and phase. A cascade effect occurs and soon we have propagated many, many photons of the same wavelength and phase. The mirror at one end of the laser is half-silvered, meaning it reflects some light and lets some light through. The light that makes it through is the laser light. This figure illustrates how a simple ruby laser works. Now we can see all of these components in the figure. A ruby laser consists of a flash tube, a ruby rod and two mirrors. The ruby rod is the lasing medium and the flash tube pumps it. The laser in its non-lasing state. The flash tube fires and injects light into the ruby rod. The light excites atoms in the ruby. Some of these atoms emit photons. Some of these photons run in a direction parallel to the ruby's axis, so they bounce back and forth off the mirrors. As they pass through the crystal, they stimulate emission in other atoms. Monochromatic, single-phase, columnated light leaves the ruby through the half-silvered mirror, the laser light. Lasers produce such intense and precisely focused energy that they can cut through metals, ceramics, plastics and cloths. The pinpoint precision of lasers makes them particularly suitable for welding detached retinas and sealing broken blood vessels in the eye. The procedure is painless because the laser light passes straight through the patient's eyeball. Laser surgery can also help to correct eye problems such as short sight. Metal detectors A metal detector is an electronic device used specifically for the detection of buried metal objects. They use electromagnetic fields to detect the presence of metallic objects. They exist in a variety of walk-through, handheld and vehicle-mounted models and are used to search personnel for hidden metallic objects at entrances of airports, public schools, courthouses and other guarded spaces, to hunt for landmines, archaeological artifacts and miscellaneous valuables. The modern development of the metal detector began in the 1930s. Lieutenant Joseph Stanislaw Kosaki, a Polish officer attached to a unit stationed in St. Andrews, Fife, Scotland, during the early years of World War II, that refined the design into a practical detector. A typical metal detector is lightweight and consists of just a few parts, control box, shaft and search coil. Metal detectors use one of the three technologies. Very low frequency, pulse induction, beat frequency oscillation. Here we learn how a VLF method works. A typical VLF metal detector contains a coil of wire wrapped around the circular head at the end of the handle known as the transmitter coil. A battery in the top of the metal detector passes electricity down through the handle to the transmitter coil. This creates a magnetic field all around it. 
The metal detector has a second coil of wire in its head that's connected to a circuit containing a loudspeaker. If you sweep the detector above a metal object, the magnetic field penetrates right through it. The magnetic field creates an electric field inside the object. This electric field creates another magnetic field all around the object. The magnetic field cuts through the receiver coil moving up above it. The magnetic field makes electricity flow around the receiver coil and up through the receiver circuit to a loudspeaker that beeps to alert you've found something. The closer you move the transmitter coil to the piece of metal, the stronger the magnetic field the transmitter coil creates in it. The stronger the magnetic field the metal creates in the receiver coil, the more current that flows loudspeaker and the louder the noise. Night Vision Device A night vision device or NVD is an optical instrument that allows images to be produced in levels of light approaching total darkness. Night vision devices were originally developed for military use but have since spread into other areas such as security and police work, rescue outfits and various amateur uses. Creatures that live in the dark tend to have much bigger pupils to let in more light. Cats which also spend much of their time hunting at night are among creatures whose eyes contain a tape tum. This is a natural mirror that reflects light back out of the eye. Its job is to bounce the incoming light twice through the animal's retina so the animal has twice the chance to see things. That's why cats are so good at seeing in the dark. Humans can't use any of these tricks because we don't have a tape tum. So what can we do to see at night? We can reach for technology. Night vision goggles boost a dim dark scene in a series of simple steps. Dim light from a night scene enters the lenses at the front. The light is actually made of photons and as they enter the goggles they strike a light sensitive surface called a photocathode. It's a bit like a very precise solar panel. Its job is to convert photons into electrons. The electrons are amplified and then fired at a screen coated with phosphor chemicals like the screen on an old fashioned television. As the electrons hit the phosphor, they create tiny flashes of light. Since there are many more photons than originally entered the goggles, the screen makes a much brighter version of the original scene. So why does everything look green through night vision goggles? The incoming photons carry light of all colors, but when they are converted to electrons, there's no way to preserve that information. Effectively, the incoming colored light is turned into black and white. Why then don't night vision goggles look black and white? The phosphors on their screens are deliberately chosen to make green pictures because our eyes are more sensitive to green light. It's also easier to look at green screens for long periods than to look at black and white ones. That's why night vision goggles have their characteristic eerie green glow. Microwave Microwaves are radio waves that are roughly around 2500 megahertz or 2 gigahertz. These radio waves have the interesting property of being absorbed by water, fats and sugars. This absorption converts them directly into atomic motion, thus producing heat. It is not the movement of the microwaves themselves that produces heat, but rather the movement of the excited particles in the food. Microwave ovens are popular because they cook food in an amazingly short amount of time. They are also extremely efficient in their use of electricity because a microwave oven heats only the food and nothing else. The magnetron inside a microwave oven uses magnetic energy to create microwaves. Unlike a conventional oven where the heat has to migrate through the food, the heat produced by a microwave is able to cook food evenly as all of the particles in the food are excited simultaneously. Microwaves do have limits. They may not permeate between thick pieces of food. Since the microwaves are emitted from only one side of the oven, it is recommended that you use a microwave which contains a spinning plate to ensure that food cooks evenly. Like many great inventions, microwave ovens were an accidental discovery. Back in the 1950s, American electrical engineer Percy Spencer was carrying on some experiments with a magnetron. 
At that time, the main use for magnetrons was in radar, a way of using radio waves to help airplanes and ships find their way around in poor weather or darkness. One day, Percy Spencer had a candy bar in his pocket when he switched on the magnetron. To his surprise, the bar quickly melted because of the heat the magnetron generated. This gave him the idea that a magnetron might be used to cook food. After successfully cooking some popcorn, he realized he could develop a microwave oven for cooking all types of food. A microwave oven has several main parts. Inside the strong metal box, there is a microwave generator called a magnetron. When you start cooking, the magnetron takes electricity from the power outlet and converts it into high-powered 12 cm radio waves. It blasts these waves into the foot compartment through a channel called a waveguide. The foot sits on a turntable spinning slowly round so the microwaves cook it evenly. When the microwaves reach the foot, they don't simply bounce off. Just as radio waves can pass straight through the walls of your house, so microwaves penetrate inside the food. As they travel through it, they make the molecules inside it vibrate more quickly. Vibrating molecules have heat, so the faster the molecules vibrate, the hotter the food becomes. Thus, the microwaves pass their energy onto the molecules in the food, rapidly heating it up. Telescope A telescope is an instrument designed for the observation of remote objects by the collection of electromagnetic radiation. The earliest evidence of working telescopes were the refracting telescopes that appeared in the Netherlands in 1608. Their development is credited to three individuals, Hans Lippershey and Zachariah Janssen who were spectacle makers in Middleburg and Jacob Metius of Alkmaar. Galileo greatly improved upon these designs the following year. Galileo's telescope was a refracting telescope. Isaac Newton, who was born the same day Galileo died, invented another kind of telescope called a reflecting telescope. Refracting telescope. As light passes through glass, it slows down. Slowing down a light beam makes it bend. The shape of the lens means light near the top of the lens is bent down and light near the bottom of the lens is bent up. Somewhere inside the tube, the light beams cross. But before they can spread out again, the eyepiece lens bends the light beams again and sends them to the eye. Because the light beams cross, the image ends up upside down. This doesn't matter much when you're looking at Mars or the Moon, but refracting telescopes used to see objects here on Earth often have another set of lenses to flip the image right side up again. Probably the world's most famous telescope today is the Hubble Space Telescope. It is a reflecting telescope that orbits 600 kilometers above the Earth. Because it is above the Earth's atmosphere, Hubble is able to see faraway objects more clearly than any telescope in history.